morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us here today at the PCA support group meeting. Um, this is our August meeting. Um, and yeah, we think we've got about 85 or 90 of you registered today. Um, so hopefully you're all um, logging on now as I'm saying hello. Um, I can see the attendee numbers are creeping up, um, which is great. So welcome. And we have got a really um, good agenda today. Maybe I'll just hang on for a minute or so um, for any late arrivals. Uh, but yeah, a really good agenda today and looking forward to introducing you um, to our different speakers. Okay, so let's get going. Um, so yeah, thank you. Thank you for joining us. And we'll be having um, some updates about research and the RDS service today um, but also really excitingly we've got two RDS members here um, to speak to us um, which is great and then that will all take up the first half of the meeting and then for the second half of the meeting we'll have a panel Q&A discussion um, so please do send in any questions that you have that you would like to put to the panel um, in the questions box which you should be able to see on your screen and the panel is made up of, of members with lived experience of PCA and also um, members of our clinical research and support teams as well. So any sorts of questions you have, um, please do send them in and we'll find someone um, on the panel to answer them, I'm sure. Um, and just also to be aware that um, hopefully this meeting will be as PCA friendly as we can make it, but we're conscious that um, obviously it's there's a lot of visuals. Um, we hope that in our explanations and talking around the topic, you'll all be able to um, hear what we're saying and get, get the main messages um, that we're trying to communicate. And just thank you for bearing with um, our format. Um, and also really sorry not to be able to see you all face to face, obviously, but um, really glad that those of you who might not have been able to join us, even if we were face to face, are able to join us in this online format. Um, that's really encouraging. So thank you all for being here. Um, I, just to introduce myself, sorry, I've just realised I haven't done that. Um, I'm Emma Harding and a research fellow at the Dementia Research Centre and I've worked on a PCA research project um, for a number of years now. Um, and I'm now working on the Rare Dementia Support Impact Study, which is studying um, the impacts of support groups for people with rarer types of dementia. Um, and have also helped to lead the PCA support group for a number of years now. So hopefully I know many of you who are watching and welcome to any of you who are here um, for the first time. Um, and Seb, did you want to add anything to that? Thank you, Emma. Yes. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name's Seb Crutch. Uh, I'm one of the psychologists um, at the Dementia Research Centre and involved in um, co-leading rare dementia support. And I'd just like to echo Emma's warm welcome. Uh, wherever you are, I think the from meeting with uh, the team, the wider team uh, at rare dementia support, who you'll be meeting during the meeting. Oh, I've said the word meeting three times now, but... <laughs> uh, in the absence of our being able to physically get together, you'll be seeing on your screens and hearing from a number of the team. Um, but we're all in different, scattered around in different places, um, as I'm sure you are. Um, and we hope wherever you're coming to us from, whether it's in the UK or abroad, um, that we can have some sense of community together. And I also just wanted to second what um, Emma said about we're very aware that particularly for those of you living with PCA, that um, a, a, a a meeting format like um, like we have today of small images of faces on the screens is not ideal. And for me in particular, I just noticed looking at um, my image on the screen that depending on the light coming through the window um, uh, where I am, my face variably appears sometimes like a face and sometimes like a sort of very bright triangle of, of, of light. Um, and that, I guess, echoes so many of the stories we've heard um, in these meetings over the years of the strange and unusual ways in which um, these brain site problems caused by PCA and other difficulties can affect your lives. So we're very aware that this is not the, the perfect format, um, but we hope that with, um, with goodwill and a good internet connection, you'll at least be able to hear our voices clearly um, and be able to share in some of the stories and, of course, be able to share your own stories and questions when we come to the question answer format a bit later on. Um, it's also just a brief reminder that this is very much not the only way in which you can um, chat to members of the team. 
uh, as uh, Olivia and Nikki will be saying later on, the direct uh, support team is available at any time um, for phone and email uh, conversations by arrangement with you um, about issues that are currently very pressing for you or just to keep in touch. Um, and many of us have been also been have the privilege of being involved in new small online discussion groups that we've set up during lockdown where we can talk about deeper issues in a more intimate setting um, with half a dozen or so other people in a similar situation to you. So if either of those formats um, are appealing, then please do um, watch out for our um, letter that will go out around the beginning of September telling you about our programme for the year ahead. Emma, back to you. Thanks, Sam. Um, okay, so very excited to introduce our first um, speaker and what will happen now is we're going to break um, to a short video interview, um, which is part of a series called Conversations with Experts, um, which has been led and produced by Dr. Chris Hardy, who is a senior research fellow at the Dementia Research Centre and also um, the education officer for Rare Dementia Support. And the idea with these videos is to have um, experts who have lived with the condition and have a lived experience of, of a condition alongside professional experts asking questions of each other um, to hopefully capture some of the different expertise um, around those experiences. And the idea is that these will be educational resources that we can share with different professionals um, and students and, and people affected by um, different rare dementias um, to really share some of that information and knowledge um, about the condition. So the video we're going to play you now is one of our RDS PCA support group members as Valerie Mansfield, um, whose late husband Peter had PCA. And this is a, a brief video of Val in conversation with Seb um, about the experience of PCA. And this is a short version of a, of a one hour video, which we'll be able to link you to um, after the meeting if you would like to see um, the full video. And if there's anything in here that you would like to ask questions of Val and Seb um, in the discussion section later on, please do send those in. Um, and I'm going to hand over and Millie in the background now is going to work some magic and, and play the video. So we'll see you after this. It's lovely to see you, Val. Been a while since, we, since we've spoken, and so I was curious to know maybe if you could tell us a little bit about what you'd first noticed, your Peter, um, what first changed, what made you, what started you down this route. Yes, thank you. Um, well, um, odd things started in 2011 um, when Peter became highly anxious about things, and he'd always been a very calm, uh, a calm man who didn't seem to be phased by tremendous work pressures or anything so that seemed a bit strange but we wondered if perhaps it was his, his sister had died my mother had died whether there were additional things but um, didn't think too much of that and then lots of very strange unrelated things started to happen over the course of the next year and a half um, when he was driving he would sometimes not be sure of the lane that he should be in and whether the traffic lights were in the lane that he was driving in now this didn't happen very often but it was just something he noticed and he knew the, the road extremely well. Sometimes he'd be walking down the road and he'd start shuffling as if um, he couldn't walk properly or he would trip up, but then that disappeared. Um, occasionally he'd be cooking something and then he'd almost fall asleep when he was eating his food or he'd become quite sleepy during the day at different times and then wake up again. Um, and then pegging out washing on the line, he would peg it out over four parts of the line and perhaps put six pegs together. And his visual spatial awareness had always been very good as a very accomplished artist himself. Um, so there were lots of things that we couldn't quite put our finger on, but we didn't know, we knew something was happening, but we didn't know what it was. And over what sort of period was this happening? So this was 2011. Um, by 2013, there were quite a lot of other things that seemed to be creeping in. Um, it was taking him a long time to go shopping. 
uh, and I couldn't work out why he was away so long. And he was following a recipe, but he'd walk around the supermarket to try and find things in the order on the recipe card because he didn't really remember where the different sections were. So it was taking him sometimes three hours to shop for things for um, a meal. And we couldn't work out why that was taking a long time. And then cutting, cutting food up, it would be in different sizes and shapes. Um, so this was 2011, and um, he did actually have an appointment with a neurologist in 2013. Um, and they sent him to, for all sorts of tests, as lots of people have, um, he, was, um, he went to Bristol to see um, a consultant for normal pressure hydro hydrocephalus, um, but that wasn't um, conclusive. Um, and so by 2014, he didn't feel he, he, he'd given, um, been given health psychology tests, visual field tests, and nothing seemed to come back conclusive. So we did ask for a second opinion, actually, and managed to find ourselves at um, the Specialist Cognitive Disorder Clinic, um, having had um, a diagnosis in 2015 of posterior cortical atrophy. I am interested to know, obviously some people may well be watching this, um, who've been told they have PCA, but have never really had it explained to them by a specialist. Um, mm -hmm. Please, would you be able to explain this um, to us and give further information to people who may well be um, in the early stages of uh, finding their way through? Sure. So I, I suppose I most often describe um, PCA as a progressive um, disorder affecting the back of the brain. Um, and the most common thing people describe are some of the difficulties that you were noticing and describing in Peter, those difficulties of seeing what things are and where they are. Um, but of course, it, as we've come to realise, particularly in recent years and with discussions with people such as yourself and other members of the support group, it's very much not just a visual dementia, even if that kind of for ease label it but actually it's it because it affects all of the skills that are supported by the back of the brain then lots of people also notice early changes in things like calculation and spelling and writing um difficulties with um parts of everyday life that require kind of ordering or understanding magnitude so even a simple task like if you've got some leftovers after dinner judging what size of pot put the leftovers mm. into becomes very difficult um, and also increasingly realizing people might have some difficulties with things like their sense of balance or their body position and we've certainly lost count of the number of people who've talked about dressing difficulties from um, the kind of the simple like getting your sleeve in a jacket to the downright frustrating and personal like getting your pants the wrong way around the difficulty putting a tie on um, and I suppose one of the other Kind of confusions or frustrations sometimes people have about the label PCA is the distinction between the fact that it's it's a syndrome, it's basically a description of a bunch of symptoms and experiences, um, very similar to what you described, um, but it's not a disease in its own right. So we know that PCA, the syndrome, this progressive set of visual and other spatial and so forth problems, can be caused by several different um, neurodegenerative diseases. Um, by far and away, the most common one is Alzheimer's disease. Um, probably 80, maybe 90% of people with PCA have it because there's Alzheimer's disease, the plaques and tangles of that disease affecting the back of their brain, the visual and other centers of the brain rather than the memory centers. Um, but there are also a couple of other conditions, diseases that can cause PCA such as Lewy body disease or something called corticobasal degeneration. Um, and I guess particularly in relation to the label Alzheimer's disease, because that's such a well-known term and because people have, many people have such strong preconceptions about it, um, then certainly in, the, in our support group, is, as you yourself will know, lots of people are very averse to using that label the fear that saying that they've got Alzheimer's disease will lead people to presume a whole bunch of things about them which aren't true because 
P living with PCA does seem to be really very different to living with typical memory-led Alzheimer's disease. It may be the same disease, but because it's affecting very different parts of the brain, the challenges, the uncertainties, the questions um, people have are really quite markedly different. And do you mind me asking um, what, how you would describe PCA or posterior cortical atrophy to other people? all those many people you came across and I'm sure family and friends as well who didn't likewise had never heard of it what how did you describe it to, what, what in your own your or your and Peter's words what, what what did you say was was happening with them um I think we we tried to make it quite simple although we appreciate it's a very complicated rare disorder um so we just tried to say that sometimes um things may not look the same the perception of where something is or how you see things may well look very different to Peter, to us. And I'll give you an example. When we were um, bird watching, one of our friends said, oh, look at that heron over there. He's right in front of us. And um, Peter couldn't see it. It was very static, huge, huge bird. And our friend got very frustrated and said, but you must be able to see it. it's right in front of you. And he said, I'm really sorry, I can't see it. And then a bit later, he said, oh, can you see that wren in the leaves there? And our friend said, how can you see that? But you can't see a heron. And obviously, you know, the wren was moving, but it was still camouflage. So a lot of people were grateful that we tried to explain what the difficulties were. I'm sure, I'm sure. Um, and in the days and sort of weeks after the diagnosis, um, how do you go about figuring out how to live with this condition? You've had all these years of uncertainty. And now you had a label, um, but as you say, not necessarily a full understanding of what that meant for now or for the future. What, what did the day-to-day -day look like and what were the kind of challenges you were facing? Um, I think initially we tried to keep going. We always like walking and so we would still go and walk, we would still meet with friends, um, and we were fortunate to have friends who would take us out when driving became difficult um, for me, because we had a car accident part of the way through, and I then couldn't drive for six months, so um, that wasn't very helpful. Um, so we just tried to do as much as we could, and because we had a very good supportive network, um, I think we were very fortunate to still be able to do um, a lot of things. Obviously, there were days where we felt quite disheartened and I think there were some days when the medication needed to get um, it was river stick mine patches Pete had um, sometimes when the medication initially started to be introduced you know there were a few problems with that um, so I think we were just trying to adapt and adjust on a daily basis um, and try and change some of the things we were doing so we may be going bird watching but we might do it slightly differently. And I wouldn't draw attention to birds unless Peter drew my attention to them because he was very aware there were some things that he couldn't actually um, see or do. Um, and obviously it was quite good to know that there was nothing wrong with his eyes or his eyesight. So you were gradually finding ways of not stopping all the things you enjoy doing and that Peter love, but rather adapting and finding yes. ways to keep doing them maybe in a slightly different way. Yes, yes, I think I think that's um that's a fair thing. And I think, you know, the daily, you know, you were always assessing things. I think the thing that we often felt was we were being caught out because we didn't know what was going to happen because things would change. When people said about, you know, a difficult day, I said, no, this can change in five minutes. And that was something I don't think we were prepared for. Uh, so it did catch us out quite often. And we think, oh, you've got to change that or do that. So I think you do have to be um, quite flexible um, and also um, try and assess what situation you're in and look at strategies. But that's quite difficult to do on a daily basis. And we were grateful that we had other people helping to suggest things and obviously the research um, that Peter took part in with the rare dementia support, um, they were all things he really wanted to, to take part in. And it made him feel that he was contributing to something which was really important for his own identity. 
Absolutely. We so often hear that, that it's a taking part in, in research and building and sharing your own experiences as a condition are a great way of sort of fighting back against it in some way and making that contribution. Yes, yes, I think that that was very helpful for him. What's your hope for PCA research moving forward? I suppose I remain, my greatest hope is because for the majority of people PCA has caused um, the underlying neurological disease is Alzheimer's disease. I remain very hopeful that uh, the pro huge progress and in international effort and energy that's going into finding um, either disease modifying treatments or ultimately some sort of uh, cure or something that really slows down the progression of the condition will apply and be effective not just for people with the memory led and later onset forms um, of the condition but also for people with PCA. So I suppose one of my hopes for future PCA research is that it would be representative and that, for example, by making PCA um, better known um, and making um, ad appropriate adaptions to the kind of trials we do. So obviously, if you test out new Alzheimer drugs using visual memory tests, those are probably not going to be very appropriate measures for someone who you know, couldn't see the thing you're asking to, them to remember in the first place. Um, so by sharing awareness of what are appropriate measures of things like cognitive performance, be it perception or memory or language, and making sure that the design of new drug trials doesn't ex essentially exclude um, people with PCA, then I hope um, the PCA community will be able to join in and benefit from that wider research effort. Um, and perhaps in the more immediate term, my hope is that we will keep having an increasing conversation that makes a larger number of groups and creative people around the world listen to the experiences of people with PCA, understand and investigate some of the lesser known or more poorly understood um, conditions um, associated with it, like balance problems or specific um, activities like reading problems so that we can, even if we can't yet slow or stop the disease in the way that we want to, we can better support people to live and adapt and um, to use what you were saying you and Peter did with your, with many of your hobbies, advise people how to keep going with the things that are important and meaningful to them um, in spite of um, the progressive um, changes in their vision and other skills. Um, so that, that sort of dual aim of, yes, let's do all we can to find cures or disease modifying treatments, but also let's not for a moment delay trying to um, provide people with um, the informed scientific basis of informed support that will help them to make the absolute most of lives being lived right now. Thanks so much, um, Val and Seb, for your um, contributions to that video. Um, I'm sure lots of you found that um, very, that it resonated possibly a lot with some of your experiences. And I think just such a nice um, opportunity to have those different types of expertise in one place. Um, I think that will be a really valuable educational resource for us going forward. Um, I'm always struck by the example Val uses of um, Peter being able to see the wrens, but not the heron. Um, and I think that's one of those sort of really unusual symptoms in PCA that can be quite hard to describe um, and quite hard for other people to understand. But the, the importance of being able to explain those things to, to family and friends and professionals as well, obviously, is, is really high. So great that we've got um, some resources in the works to be able to help us with that. And as I said, we'll link you to the, the longer version of that video if you would like to see more. And if you have any questions for Val and Seb um, following that video, do please send them in. Um, so we're going to now move on to some research and service updates and I'm first going to welcome Livy Wood who many of you will have spoken to. She's part of our Rare Dementia support te direct support team um, and Livy's going to tell us a bit about the service and the impact study. Um, so over to Livy. Thanks Livy. 
Lovely. Thank you, Emma. And thank you, Val and Seb, for that amazing interview. Such a valuable contribution. I'm sure you'll all agree at home. So it's really lovely to be here today. It would be much better to see you all in person. My colleagues and I have been talking to our screens now since March. And as you can imagine, we'd much more rather be looking at your lovely faces as opposed to our screens today. And we're really excited to see everyone again in person when it's safe to do so. I'm going to keep my contribution brief today as we have as we have a lot of other fantastic speakers but to introduce myself for those who I've not had the pleasure of speaking to I'm Olivia or Libby and I'm one third of the direct support team along with my colleagues Nikki Zimmerman and Claire Waddington and I'm also heavily involved in the RDS impact project which I'd like to speak to you a little bit about today first though about the direct support team and what we do as of this week, we have a total of 655 members signed up to RDS for PCA support from around the world. And this number includes people with a diagnosis, their family members, friends, and also healthcare professionals who've come to us directly for support and advice for people with a PCA diagnosis. And this number is ever growing. So the direct support team can provide post-diagnostic support and person-centered support, along with information and advice about PCA. So whether this is navigating the healthcare system, getting a formal diagnosis, or helping people understand their diagnosis further. We can also signpost you to relevant services, which assist greatly with things like care planning. And we can also guide you to appropriate local services and help in your area. We offer confidential support via email, telephone, telephone call, or now through an online video platform called GoToMeeting. That's a lot like Zoom for people who've used that before. If you think either yourself or a loved one would benefit from this, I'll be giving our contact email address at the end of my talk. So on to the research. So we're currently recruiting for the RDS impact study. A huge thank you for those who have already participated so far. This is the first major study looking at the value of support groups for people living with or supporting someone with a rare form of dementia. And we're looking to recruit people with a diagnosis, their carers and family members, and people who've previously cared for somebody with a rare type of dementia. So all experience from all different stages. So whether yourself or your loved one is at the beginning of their journey with PCA, or whether they've been diagnosed for some time, you're all expert in your own right. And we really want to hear your experiences and learn from you. So it's quite a large study. There are five parts to it. These include interviews and discussions. So this will be either in individually with one of our research team or with other members in form of um, maybe a small group discussion. We have completing questionnaires and scales, helping us to develop our website or design measures and creative activities, where we'll ask you to represent your responses by drawing rather than writing um, or telling us verbally. You can choose to take part in multiple parts of the study or just one if you prefer, and you can also change your mind or opt out of any part of the study if you no longer wish to be involved. The interviews would be on a yearly basis, and this is so we can track progress, but also identify any help and support that you may need. And at this point, it ties in quite nicely with how the RDS study and the direct support team really do come together. So as well as hugely benefiting the research project by sharing your thoughts, feelings, and lived experiences in the interviews and small group discussions, it has also proved to be extremely good um, at identifying areas where you may need further support. So whether this is further education, information about future planning, or just enlightening as to what support services may actually be available to you. So for example, the Rare Dementia Support Budgeting Service or local charities. So as a result, a high proportion of our interviews often lead to support calls with the direct support team to talk further about support needs and what is available. If you're interested in hearing more about the research or if you'd like to chat to one of us regarding support, um, so please do email us. Our email address is contact at rarededementiasupport.org. That's contact at rarededementiasupport.org and myself, Claire or Nikki will be in contact with you. Thank you all for listening and I'm gonna hand you back over to Emma. Thanks very much, Libby. That's all great information, thank you. Um, and our next um, 
contributor is Dr. Kia Yong, who many of you will know is a senior research fellow at the Dementia Research Centre at UCL. And Kia is joining us from Italy. So Wi-Fi permitting, um, he will be able to tell you a little bit about a citizen science um, research proposal. Yeah. Great, thank you, Emma. Um, so along with Seb, Val, Emma and others, I've been developing a research proposal on promoting citizen science working. Now, by this, I mean more formally acknowledging the roles of people living with PCA and family members, really in steering and directing avenues of research. Now, as we've heard briefly from um, Seb and Val, this is related to improving our understanding over the past few years of particular visual symptoms, so particular problems perceiving objects in clutter, particular reading difficulties, so for example, people's tendency to get lost on a page of text, or also balance disturbances, as well as, again, over uh, recent years, really using this understanding to better inform support strategies. Now, a lot of these developments have really come about through exchanges with research participants, as well as support group members. Um, but in addition, uh, exchanges through support groups have really been key in promoting better professional understanding of counterintuitive symptoms and have led to the development of the first multi-center consensus criteria for posterior cortical atrophy to build capacity for larger scale studies of PCA. So the proposal that I've been developing uh, really hopes to better harness both people's lived and professional expertise. Um, so this includes, but isn't limited uh, to people who might have professional backgrounds in health and social care, uh, engineering and IT, education and communications, as well as design. So we really want to get through to people uh, from a range of backgrounds and figure out how also to reach uh, existing professionals with a range of backgrounds. Now, ultimately, we hope to uh, better harness people's understanding uh, and expertise um, to really get a better insight into some of the symptoms that are quite counterintuitive and don't strictly speaking relate just to vision alone. So these can include um, really difficulties in combining different types of senses during activities such as dressing, with aspects of mobility and um, ultimately again to better support people um, living with these are quite difficult to grasp and, and currently not well understood symptoms. Thanks Kia and um... Thank you for the update, that was great. Um, and Kia will be on our panel um, as well later for questions and answers. So again, do feel free to send any um, over that you would like to put to Kia about research generally or that proposal in particular. Um, I'm now going to welcome um, our regional group coordinator, Roberta McKee-Jackson, who many of you will know. Um, and Roberta is going to give us an update about the regional um, side of the service and how that's um, all going at the moment. Thank you, Roberta. Thank you, Emma. It's great to be here. And as Livy said, I'm sorry we can't see you all in person. But um, I would like to give you a little bit of an update about our regional groups. We have around 25 um, that are in existence throughout the UK. And that includes um, ones that support not only PCA, but PPA, FTD. And then we have some that we refer to as all types because they're ones that actually can cater to multiple of the various rare dementias. Um, as you can imagine, during the lockdown, a lot of things have changed, and those, those same things have changed within our regional support groups, um, from the fact that you can no longer meet virtual, uh, you can't meet in person, so we've been having virtual meetings with quite a few of our groups. Um, and also, there's been issues within groups that uh, say are supported by a trust or a charity where they've been, their uh, resources have been pulled off for other things. So they're kind of on hold at the moment. So I will say that some of our groups are in flux. We've also had some issues with some of our regional facilitators who um, are either changing or perhaps uh, for one reason or another have not been able to you know, step up to that. So there will be some changes being made, but 
what I would like to reiterate to everyone is these meetings are taking place virtually. I've made an offer to every single regional group that to host a meeting through our GoToMeeting platform so that you can still meet and that, that you can still get together and share your experiences with the other people in your regional group. Um, some of the interesting things is, and there have been a number of groups that I've been hosting those meetings for. Um, one interesting thing is, is that a couple of groups um, decided in July that they were going to try, because the weather was nice, that they would try actually meeting outside in a park or in a pub garden type situation. And we have another one um, that's doing that next month as well. I think that's probably going to bring an end to those group meetings outside just because of the weather, unless we have some really nice weather, um, you know, unexpectedly. But again, the offer to host these virtual meetings is always there. And, um, you know, I think it's proved a great lifeline for a lot of these groups that they can still meet virtually and share your experiences. We also have um, had plans to expand and create new groups. Some of those have somewhat been put on hold because those were a lot of those were centered around uh, cultural venues in, in cities throughout the UK. Although I will say I have had um, a couple of people lately who have called and I'm talking to them about starting some groups on their own in their area who would start virtually at this point in time, but then that may expand. So it's, a, it's always in flux, but just for you to always know that there's regional support out there to provide for anybody. So if, if you have any questions about that, please get in touch with me and I'm happy to help you. Thank you, Emma, that's all. Thanks very much, Roberta. And yeah, just so reassuring to know, especially at the moment, um, the flexibility in those formats for the regional group delivery. That's great. Thank you very much. Um, and so we're now on to our next um, member contribution. So this, um, we're now going to redirect you to a video. And I think the video was perhaps didn't work for a couple of you the first time around, or maybe you could only access the audio. Um, and apologies for that, just to reassure you that the whole meeting will be recorded and uploaded to our YouTube channel later. So um, you should be able to catch up with those videos um, later if they're not working for you at the moment. Um, so I'm really pleased to introduce um, Martina Davis, a member of our PCA support group who was diagnosed with PCA last year, um, in conversation with Nikki Zimmerman, who leads our direct support team, um, who I'm sure most of you will have been in touch with at one point or another. Um, and here's a conversation about those kind of challenges and management strategies um, that come with PCA day to day. So here's that video. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. It's fantastic to be here again with you virtually. As I say every time, I'm missing seeing everybody, missing being at the Welcome Centre, but at least we're staying safe and well, and we are being able to bring you some sort of support via these support group meetings. Um, I am delighted to be here with one of our very valued members, as you all are, of RDS. Uh, we have got with us today Martina Davis, and Martina was diagnosed with PCA in December last year, so 2019. Um, and Martina is going to share some of her experience with us today. So um, first of all, Martina, can you tell me a little bit about the first signs you noticed and about the assessment and diagnosis process you went through, please? Yes, good morning, Nikki. It's lovely to see you as always. Um, yeah, the first thing I noticed, and I didn't actually connect it to, um, to, to any illness, was that I had lost or was losing and lost the ability to write with my left hand. Um, and I always up for writing to a challenge. I carried on and I actually taught myself to write with my right hand. Then shortly after that, I noticed that um, my abilities for calculating, um, which I needed in my business, I was self-employed, but calculation and administration, I could no longer hold that information at all in my head. So I went along to the doctors who were really, really good, and we started the process of finding out what was wrong with me. And initially I was diagnosed with MCI, um, I was very fortunate in the assessments that I've had, and they're very much on the ball. And um, it took about three assessments, 
and when I got my diagnosis of PCI. And from then, the support I've had from the team that um, have worked with me, the consultants team and the memory team, has been absolutely second to none. Going the extra mile all of the time, checking calls, it's all still happening now. It's brilliant. It's so good to hear that you have had such a positive experience after having that diagnosed and you've got so much support um, around you. We, we know from our members, not everybody has such a thorough assessment. It happens so quickly to get that result to them. And, you know, sometimes they're left sort of without any support. So it's really lovely that you, you always tell me about the fantastic sort of members of the team that, you know, are still supporting you for today. Are there any particular day-to-day -day challenges that you've associated with the more physical aspects of having PCA? Um, yes, um, falling, um, walking into doors, um, all the usual stuff really. Um, the challenges of words upside down and inside out. I'm sure there should be a degree in there somewhere for me. But, um, um, you know, typing, I won't give up on that but that's becoming a thing of the past. And against all these challenges that I have faced now, it, it seems such a shame that it's related to all the things I used to do. Um, you know, I used to have an accounting business. I used to write for a magazine. Um, I used to create spreadsheets for business clients to see how the business was, was going. So all these challenges that have now come along, um, sometimes you don't know what to do but then i was taught by nikki i've always been a good problem solver to take my skills um of positivity and objectivity and actually move them into where i am now and i would say that's a turning point for me and now what i do is i don't say i've got a diagnosis or i've got pca what I actually do is I say, fine, I've got this diagnosis, I have got PCA, but, you know, come on, girl, let's actually use these skills that you've got and let's actually match them up. And if there are things that I can't manage, I will ask for help. So, yeah, those challenges are quite, quite gruesome at times, but I manage them. I'll just sort of uh, clarify here that Nikki is your OT at home and, and I'm not taking credit for all of this because my name is <laughs> Nikki as well, but you're, you're very lucky to have that support. It's great. And she does sound absolutely fantastic. Now, uh, sort of since I sort of initially sort of met you, we've had quite a few conversations and we've talked about positive risks and finding solutions because I, I always feel with you, you've always got a solution for uh, anything that you sort of come against. Can you tell me a little bit more about this? Yeah, I think being self-employed, and I've been self-employed for, for most of my life, and personally for me, I think that's helped me get through so much because self-employment means you have got to keep finding solutions, you have got to keep finding clients, you have got to keep going. And so in, in, a, in a strange way, I call what I've got mountains and molehills. And I had mountains and molehills in my previous life, if you like. Um, they just happen to be stinkers sometimes. And I think acknowledging and finding solutions hopefully puts back the day when these things become volcanoes and, and, and start erupting. And I don't know if you've noticed, but I do use a lot of expressions um uh, when i'm speaking and the reason for that is is because it's not only my um typing and writing and, and reading that's totally gone down the swanee it's because also my thinking is very difficult and that's one of the biggest challenges that i've had so finding the solutions of being able to bore people senseless the way i do has actually been able to <laughs> <laughs> to find expressions that just come out from, you know, from nowhere. Um, and that is also enabling me to be able to hold, hold conversations and, and, and carry on the, the way I do. I love your creative expressions. I think it's absolutely fantastic. Such, such a, um, a picture in my mind every time that we have our conversations. 
Now, you're really quite an active person and always been very well engaged with your community. How have you managed to continue with you, managing the engagement with activities? I think it's got to be through positivity. And, um, you know, there are lots of days when I don't feel so positive. Uh, you know, I'm not this jack-in-the-box, jumping Mexican bean, so here we go again, sort of person um, that is, you know, is, is the Duracell bunny. But I think I never wake up in the morning thinking, what's today going to be like? How am I going to feel? I get up in the morning and say, right, it's another day and move forward in, in, in that day. And I think that positivity also helps people around me in engaging with me because I like to think that I export something to them that they'll pick up and they'll actually run with. And instead of saying to me, oh dear, what's wrong with you? How are you today? They'll say, how are you today? Is there anything wrong? Is there anything I can help with? And I think that makes the biggest difference um, uh, to your life because you, it's absolute pants when you're looking for something that you know is where it should be. And then you go back and you find it. It's rubbish when you're pouring something out of um, a jug or a glass and you can hear, you can hear that noise, but your eyes are telling you that it's in suspended animation. And getting people to try and accept and interact with that isn't easy. You know, the strange looks for me are now going, I think, when I say, to, I say, well, actually, do you really want to know? I've just seen this. There was a jug on the floor that, um, you know, I walked past and I think that's Rocky the cat. And I walked past it one day and it moved. And I, I looked down and I said, oh, thank God, Rocky, it is you you know, as it, as it wandered off. So it's that kind of, that kind of positivity, instead of saying, oh, here we go again, and it bringing you down. I think it's that that's helped me with engaging with people. And, and, and I think people have got a, a certain amount of respect because I am trying to be as positive I, as I can, even during the absolute rubbish days. Fantastic. I'm sure you bring lots of positivity to everybody's lives, Martina. Now, we often hear about people feeling isolated when they've got a diagnosis of PCA. Has isolation affected you at all? Yes, it has. Um, I think PCA uh, is, is a, a strange one in terms of isolation because, apart from anything else, it's the visual impairment side of things. I think people are much better when they can either see, feel or touch something. And I think the empathy that comes through um, with, with an illness that they can see, feel and touch is different to what I've experienced with, with PCA. And that isolation of um, looking at things and not seeing things and then seeing things and then seeing my own decline in terms of um, reading and writing. Um, yeah, I felt very isolated. I think there's two types of isolation. And I think the other type is where it would be easy without the positivity and without support for you to, to think, well, where's the point? You know, um, oh, I'll go and get dressed in an hour's time, or I'll go and do this in an hour's time. And and I think that's a different kind of isolation because before you know it, time has marched on and then you've sort of spent half a day and then you're creating another sort of isolation or another isolation has been created. So I think there's two kinds of isolation that, in my opinion, would affect people with PCA and, and maybe other dementias, but that's what I found. And it was very hard initially to get over the first type of isolation and try to get people to understand. Even, you know, I would put books in front of, leaflets in front of people, and it was just, they would push that, well, you know, you've got dementia. No, I haven't. I have, but I have got this type of dementia. 
And this isn't about me shouting or anything else. This is about me saying quite loudly, please, can you help me? Can you at least look at these things and try and help me with that isolation? Great advocate out there you are, certainly. Now, have you got any inspiring advice for others living with PCA? And perhaps um, a few wise words as well for their partners or carers for them to help them live independently? I think the independent, uh, independent living in, in any diagnosis is incredibly important. And I think um, it has to interact with positivity and it has to interact with how you see it and where you want to be. Um, for me, what's got through me an awful lot is that I've decided um, that I have to relearn things and I have to create new habits. And if I do that, um, that gives me the wherewithal to actually continue doing it because this, this disease it, it changes all the time, whether that's rapidly, slowly, it doesn't really matter, but it is changing. So if I give myself the capacity of being able to make those habits become habits of the future now, then that will also give me the capacity to carry on doing it. Before I got my diagnosis, my makeup, now this might seem absolutely ridiculous, but my makeup was always a big part of my life. And um, the only way I could actually work out the right way to do it, everything had to be in line because I was putting everything on the wrong way around because I couldn't see, I couldn't see what the mascara was. I couldn't see what the blusher was. Why had I got lipstick on my nose, you know? Um, it, and so I, this was before I'd even gone to the doctor. So I knew there were things wrong. So I've worked out a way of lining up the brushes, lining up the pots, and just actually going through everything. I relearned how to put my makeup on. I created a new habit, like showering. Showering's become a military operation. And the only way to do that uh, is the same as dressing, is number things. If you've got seven things on a bed and you, there's nothing left on it, then you know you're fully dressed. You know, the same with showering. Um, I, everything's lined up and that way I know I haven't got in there with my PJs on or any clothes. So relearn those habits, get people to help you um, uh, relearn those habits. And it's never too late, never too late at all. I know the diagnosis as it progresses will change how that's done. Um, but you'll know you're succeeding because you're actually still finding solutions. Don't say I can't do this anymore. Just say I need to find a new way to do it. And equally, you're not a failure. You are nowhere near a failure if you decide, you know what, I'm going to call this a day. I'm actually going to say I can't be bothered with this anymore because it's coming too difficult. So say to somebody, right, can you give me a hand with this? If you need a hand with all of it, fantastic. If you only need a hand with a little bit of it, then that's absolutely great. But nobody will see you as a failure. And, and the most important thing is, do not see yourself as a failure. See yourself as a realist, moving on and putting positive energy into what you can do and being big enough to ask for help for the things that you can't. Honestly, Believe me, stand on me. It's the stuff self-esteem is made of. It really, really is. And laugh. Laughter is the biggest magnet. And don't just laugh for yourselves, because if you can laugh and you can find the funny side of things, or you can find laughter in some really happy memories, by laughing, you are engaging people. You're bringing them in. So laugh. People looking after people. It is heartbreaking when you see a person you care for and able to manage. But don't just say, I'm going to do it. Don't take it away. Just say, can I help you? Um, is there anything that you need help with? Or just think, is there any way to help keep that person's self-esteem and dignity? 
don't automatically think you're doing it with the best will in the world but don't don't just override it because your kindness and understanding is a wonderful thing and trying to understand and work with that person that is the greatest greatest gift you will ever give them that really really is a great gift Thank you so much, Martina. Lots of wise words there and very inspiring, as always, my conversations are with you. So I think, you know, it'd be very much appreciated by our audience out there today. And we're also going to be very lucky, Martina will be on our question and answer panel um, later this morning. So if she any questions, please fire them in to, um, to the uh, sources to do the chat today and uh, we'll, we'll be able to collect those a little bit later. Uh, thank you all for listening to us and I really hope um, you, you've got something out of this today because I, um, Martina is truly a very inspiring lady. Thank you. Thanks ever so much, um, Martina and Nikki, for that really, really um, inspiring and really frank conversation um, as well. I'm sure there's lots in there that's resonating um, with everyone at home. And just so, so helpful to have you talk, Martina, about that balance between independence and asking for help and the challenges, but also the skills. Um, and I know those are, are things that our members are negotiating, you know, every day. Um, so it's so helpful to have a real lived experience perspective on those. Um, and yeah, just really uplifting. Thank you. Um, so we're now moving on to questions. So do send in any questions you have for Martina as well. Um, and I'm going to welcome back um, the panel our discussion panel members. So hopefully they'll start popping up around me. Um, so we have, who do we have? So we have Livy from Direct Support Team, who you know. Also really pleased to welcome Ross. Um, so Ross is a senior clinical research fellow and honorary consultant neurologist at UCL, who some of you will know. Um, and Val and Martina, our members, thank you so much for coming back um, to answer some questions. And Kia, your internet is holding up. That's fab. <laughs> um, we're all going strong. Okay, great. Um, so the first question um, I was going to ask, we had something in the newsletter this time about um, hearing, and we often talk about PCA as a visual type of dementia, um, but we know there are other symptoms as well as the visual. Um, so I just wondered if um, anyone on our panel would be willing to talk a little bit about some of those non-visual symptoms. Um, Perhaps Val and Martina and Ross, we could come to you. Um, Val, do you want to get us started? Um, yes, thank you. Um, I think perhaps um, some of the things we hadn't appreciated that were connected with uh, PCA were things like locating sounds um, and also the volume um, of sound. Sometimes um, it was quite difficult for Peter to know where the sound was coming from if it was behind. Um, and then he would sometimes say, oh, that's really loud, but is that just me? Um, so I think there was um, an inconsistency to the volume of sounds that he was hearing, as well as where the sound was located. Um, I don't know if that's the same um, with Martina or if anyone else has any comments on that. Yeah, I think with, um, with sound, I think the first time I noticed that there was um, something wrong, if that's the right word to use, was um, we were at a, a, a small family gathering and somebody started to fire off um, party poppers. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that it actually felt like explosions were being carried out in my head. And it had almost reached a point where it felt as if my, my brain was going to explode. And it, it was a bit like the handwriting. I didn't really make any real connections. It was, a, it was afterwards um, that it's, as, as Val has just said, uh, volumes, locating noise, is it just me? Even this morning, strangely enough, um, somebody went out of the, I thought somebody had gone outside and I shouted through the bathroom window because it felt as if their voice had been thrown and they were actually in the hallway. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's, it's a strange sensation. I might just pick up on that a little bit from a medical point of view, because these are really nice descriptions. 
and they they fit in quite well with what we understand of the the brain and the the hearing is is hearing and the process of hearing and how your brain understands um sounds and, and noise is quite complicated but the the back of the brain um, has responsibility for understanding where um sounds and noises are in space um and one of the original descriptions actually of hearing problems in PCA and Alzheimer's disease is the, the cocktail party syndrome where people can't quite work out um, in a really crowded um, auditory environment where sounds are coming from and you know, filtering the sounds that are immediately in your focus from those that are in the background. And, and I think that's the sort of problems that people often describe with, with, with hearing. Um, but having said that, not not everybody uh, with PCA gets hearing problems. So if if that part of the brain in your case is not involved, then you you, you may not have any hearing difficulties. Thank you. That's really helpful. Um, yeah, from both perspectives to understand um, that a little bit more. Thank you. Um, the next question I was going to go to is that this earlier this month we had the big um, International Alzheimer's Association International Conference um, and just wondered, um, Kia, perhaps if you could pick up on anything key from the conference that might be relevant for our PCA support group members. Um, thanks, Emma. So there was a variety of topics covered. At this year's AIC, despite the fact that it was in person, if anything, it made it actually more accessible for a lot of international researchers because it was free so they had over 20,000 people register for, for context this is the largest conference of Alzheimer's and dementia worldwide um, so some highlights included um, for example Nick's for, uh, Nick Fox's plenary talk on early onset Alzheimer's disease uh, which covered some particular contributions that UCL and collaborating partners as well as acknowledging the contributions of again support group members and research participants um, have enabled over recent years. This includes the largest study of the serocortical atrophy uh, to date. So looking at risk factors for PCA, uh, really led by John Schott, uh, as well as the development of the consensus criteria that I described earlier. And these outputs have really also been enabled through the atypical Alzheimer's disease professional interest area group uh, for which I was elected communications chair last year. Um, and another thing I'd like to note is at this conference, there was a lot of talk about what are considered to be other um, exemplar atypical AD presentations, posterior cortical atrophy being one of them, sometimes referred to as the visual variant of Alzheimer's disease, but there's also more movement-led presentations of Alzheimer's disease where people have particular difficulties, say, with coordinating actions or more language-led presentations of Alzheimer's disease where, for example, some auditory problems uh, or problems with speech and comprehension can be the earliest symptoms in contrast to relatively spared memory. Um, but some of the other things that's worth noting is that um, last year UCL, along with partners in um, University of California, San Francisco and University of Virgin de Rothi in Spain, published the largest study of changes of PCA over time, both in terms of uh, anatomy as well as cognitive changes. Um, but the thing that was also acknowledged this year through um, winning an award on non-pharmacological interventions to manage some of these visual symptoms and changes in sense of space that aren't strictly speaking just visual as, we, as we've heard um, was also on UCL's involvement leading the only um, non-pharmacological group studies again looking to uh, address some of these symptoms. Um, something I'd like to note coming more from a different perspective is that over the last 10 years, there's been an increased focus on really what have been referred to as biologically defined variants of Alzheimer's disease. So rather than coming from a, a symptom level, so I've been talking about visual symptoms, motor symptoms, language symptoms, that owing largely to the increasing availability of, say, structural MRI, functional MRI, or PET scanning, that this has been used as well to get an understanding about, well, what, how come some people have the same underlying changes that cause Alzheimer's, but differ a lot, not only in terms of the symptoms they're experiencing, but also certain structural aspects, say, um, of the brain. 
Thanks, Kia. Um, and yet yeah, really encouraging to just know what's happening, particularly in um, PCA. That's really helpful. Thank you. Ross, I saw you scribbling. Did you want to add something to that? Yeah, well, I, I just wanted to add a couple of things. Um, I think Kia's given a very comprehensive summary, but, but there was a, there was one really exciting thing, I think, that came out of AIC this year, which was um, the blood tests for diagnosing Alzheimer's disease. And, and that's I think I think that's a real breakthrough for diagnosis because many people in the group I'm sure will have had a lumbar puncture to confirm the diagnosis and they've now developed a blood test which is looking really promising for being able to pick up the changes of Alzheimer's disease um, in the body which is um, potentially I think five years down the line may become the sort of standard treatment or standard um, assessment tool rather than a, a lumbar puncture so I think that's good news generally. Um, I think in terms of drug trials, it was perhaps a little disappointing. I don't know if I missed something here, but there was no major um, breakthroughs on, on treatments. Um, but the other thing that I think is quite interesting is that there was a big session on clearing the brain and the brain's ability to clear proteins like um, amyloid. And I think that, that's becoming a very much more prominent area of, of research. I think we'll see some quite interesting things there in, in future in terms of developing new new medicines. Thank you. That's that's all great to hear. Thanks, Ross. Um, okay, so our next question comes from a member, um, and I wonder, Livy, if you might be able to tell us a little bit about the the buddying um, system in response to this. So, someone has said, after 18 months since my diagnosis, I have not been able to find anyone else with PCA in my area. Um, I find emailing and texting difficult, but I would like to be able to contact others by phone. Um, could you just tell us a little bit about the remind us about the buddying scheme? Oh, we can't hear you. Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry, everyone. I knew I was going to do that at some point today. <laughs> so, yes, at RDS, we have a buddying, a buddying scheme. So what that entails is people who are interested in peer-to-peer -peer support. So this is informal, casual support with someone who's in a similar situation to themselves. So this is for people with a diagnosis of rare dementia, but also for family relatives, carers, who may also be interested in being buddied with someone going through a similar situation to themselves. Um, what we can do is, um, my colleague Nikki and Claire and myself work quite hard to try and match people and so it's a good match with someone who has shared experiences with yourself and put you in contact and this is again um, for informal peer-to-peer -peer support. If this is something which you're interested in, if you're interested in joining our budgeting system then please do give us an email at our contact at Rare Dementia um, support.org email address and we can add you to that we might just have a chat with you as well to get a few more extra questions to see whether it's suitable for you as well or if there's anything else which we can help with in the meantime thanks Libby and I think that's um it's so common with rare conditions obviously that it, it is really hard to naturally come across people who who know um something of the experience that you're going through and um, so that's something that the buddying scheme is is really great to facilitate i wondered um vala martina if you wanted to share anything about the benefit of of peer support or what what it's offered you to be able to connect with other people who who know something about pta and your experience i think one of the great things is um the groups that I've been involved with, everybody is completely and utterly non-judgmental. I'm not suggesting for one second that people are out there and they hear that you've got a rare dementia or, or, or an illness of some kind, that they're judgmental, but because people have got such a preconceived idea about what they consider dementia is, um, there is an element of, of judgment that's actually made about you and you find that you're talking to somebody and they're already making decisions about you and about your illness and what's going to happen to you. And I've found the benefits of um, the peer support, the groups, um, the camaraderie um, in one particular group that I'm involved in, um, the discussions that come out, the sheer banter and sometimes absolute nonsense. There's so much, really, really does do so much for your self-esteem. 
but also hearing other people's experiences um, gives me a lot to reflect on um, when those meetings actually closed down and um, Nikki when she supplies the notes for us they are actually I wrote to her um, in the early stages of this and I actually said thank you for creating some some really lovely memories because these these meetings these uh, group meetings these peer things they're not just about what you get out on the day um, I'm learning I'm learning about other people I'm learning about other people's behavior I'm learning about how they deal with it but also I'm having some absolutely fabulous memories that are being created so I would say to anybody and particularly the organizers do not do away with them will you because they are so so valuable they really really are valuable um, yes I'd like to echo um, all the things that um, Martina said and uh, we sort of um, access things at three levels really so we had um, rare dementia support in London um, we were also members of our regional support group which again um, I'm still actually I still meet up you know virtually at the moment with regional support members in the group that we were involved with but also part of the buddying system that I think um, when you started it Emma I was at the very sort of forefront of trying to see how that would work and I found that extremely helpful having somebody else who had a, a better understanding than me and could suggest even more things than um, you know we had hoped for so um, we found it absolutely fantastic so thank you Thanks, Diana, Martina and Libby. Um, yeah, and do everyone get in touch if you would like to, to explore buddying a bit more. Um, we've got a question here about hallucinations and misperceptions. And I know these can sometimes be a bit confused, especially in, in PCA. So the question is, what is the difference between hallucinations and misperceptions? And do both happen in PCA? And as a follow on, is there any medication which can help with hallucinations? Uh, Ross, could I come to you first for that one? Yes, you 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 can. Um, so that's that's quite a, a slightly di difficult question because there are textbook definitions of both of these things, um, which, but I think in in, in practice, um, hallucinations are where you have something. You know, completely new in your uh, in your mind that you see, and it's often animals or children, um, and you know there's there's no basis for them. There's nothing in the world that has has triggered these. Um, whereas misperceptions are where you see some visual cue in the world, the world, and then you misinterpret it for something else. So often, when the light is dimming, you might see um, the the curtain and uh, think that it's a person standing in the room, or you uh, had a somebody recently who was looking at hanging baskets of geraniums and thought it was somebody with a, a red hat. So that's, that's, that would be a, a misperception. In terms of treatment, um, we tend to recommend the use of cholinesterase inhibitors um, for, for, for treating hallucinations. They, they have a modest effect, they don't always work, but um, normally in clinic, I would try rivastigmine um, as, as a first line treatment for hallucinations, which is available either as a tablet or, or, or as, a, as a patch. And so some people respond to that. Um, and the other cholinesterase um, inhibitor that can help is uh, donepezil. So that would be the, the treatments we would, we would consider. Thank you, Ross. Um, did anyone else want to add any? Anything on to that? Um, yes, can I just ask? Um, there were times where I live in an intergeneration house, so there were times where uh, my grandchildren may well have been sitting at the table, but to Peter, he said, oh, be careful, because you're standing on top of the table. And I wasn't quite sure where that came in the whole misperception, not necessarily hallucination stage. And similarly, um, they were standing in the bedroom and he thought they were on the windowsill, um, so that was something that was quite scary for him because he was worried they were going to hurt themselves. So that's one example. Um, I, we did find that the river stigmine patches, as Ross said, 
um, actually were helpful to help with low mood as well. I don't know if that is something that they're used for as well as um, some of the other treatments, I'm not sure. And then the only time um, that Peter had hallucinations were uh, was when he was in hospital and they were trying to um, see if some of the Parkinson's drugs, um, even though he didn't have Parkinson's, he'd had scans for that, uh, if the Parkinson's drugs would help with mobility, but they cause severe hallucinations. So that was the only time that he had real hallucinations. And obviously the consultant said, you know, where animals were on top of the, the rails. And as you said, it, they're quite frightening. Um, so obviously that had to be stopped. But I'm just interested to know where this idea of whether it's a misperception, if you're seeing somebody in a different place again, perhaps you could explain that. So yeah, I'm, I'm I'm not sure if I have a good answer for that. Is the honest um, is, is the honest truth? And I think in in PCA, lots of things to do with visual perception are very complex, and they don't fit into the sort of standard canonical descriptions of um, visual perceptual problems that that we recognise and are in the textbooks. And here, being the 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 expert in this, will maybe be able to say some more. I, I, being honest, I find these things very difficult to categorise and to, to describe. Um, the, the second point about um, hallucinations and the other things that can trigger them, that's, th these are very good points, Val, and um, while we're often tempted to rush in with medication, in reality, it's good to first of all um, establish, well, are the hallucinations bothering that person or are they bothering those around them? So should we treat them? And then the second thing is to try and do simple things that will um, perhaps um, stop them being provoked. So um, often painkillers, like opiate painkillers, like codeine, morphine, things like that, can, can make hallucinations worse. Um, so avoid these if possible. Um, improved lighting, because in, a, in an evening, dim lighting often brings on misperceptions. Um, and then if people are unwell for other medical reasons, you know, if these have come on out of the blue, then just make sure that people don't have a chest infection or a urinary infection or something like that. And, and the, the, the kind of classic trigger um, is, is dopamine. So people who are having their trial of levodopa for, that might help with the symptoms of Parkinsonism, um, that, that can often trigger um, quite flawed hallucinations. You just have to be really careful. And often it's good to do that in a, in a controlled environment. Um, and, you know, it's, f it's fine to try them as long as everybody knows that if they don't work, you know, you, you must stop them if the hallucinations appear. Yes, it was, um, that, it was that particular drug actually in hosp a hospital environment. So it was being controlled. Thank you. So, so just to chip in, so and to emphasize that I'm not a clinician, my background definitely isn't in visual or other types of hallucinations. It's more really to do with visual perception and also sense of space. Um, but I'll just start by saying or relaying the account of a gentleman who'd been involved in research a number of years back, where he would see these shadowy figures around the home. He had great insight into them and they, they didn't really cause him any discomfort. But he was quite candid and he'd say, you know, you'd see these figures around the home, but they'd never go into the bedroom. Um, and this is just to highlight how there could be a number of things that could account for this. You know, you could say that there's an expectation aspect where, you know, I might generally expect to see if, if I was to see people in my home in the corridor, you know, at the front door, but not necessarily in a private place. It could be aspects to do about the visual environment of his bedroom. So let's say there's less features that are less susceptible to being misperceived as a person. So let's say it's a hat on a coat stand. Our visual system is highly calibrated to perceive faces where actually it's really a, a collection of, of noise, or, you know, relatively simple features that we might perceive as a face, which is why cartoonish faces, you know, they can be surprisingly evocative of a face. But in addition, as Ross has said, visual symptoms in PCA are inherently really very complicated. It's not one visual problem. Almost by nature, it's a combination of visual difficulties. So for some people, it's more the problem perceiving objects amongst clutter. So Val, to go to your example, maybe it was the line, say, of the table next to, say, the line of the windowsill, which perhaps jumbled. Um, for some people, it could be difficulties um, reliably directing eye movement. So maybe someone's gaze went off 
slightly further off from where it was intended to be, and thus people's perception of space was, was slightly um, disturbed. Uh, and for other people, it's really understanding spatial relationships. So it's concepts such as left or right, which can be, again, less reliable, say, than before PCA. Um, and ultimately, under all of this is the fact that I think the boundary between perception and hallucination, if you're relying on people's kind of retrospective accounts, it can be quite hard to disentangle what the basis was. Thank you, everyone, for a really, yeah, really good and thorough exploration of that issue and all the complexities. Um, a question now for Vala Martina. Any practical advice on making eating out as easy and dignified as possible? Challenges include surrounding conversations and getting the food from plate to mouth. Don't be afraid to, afraid to ask for help. Um, uh, clearly, things like obviously plates against a white plate or against a white tablecloth, um, coloured napkins, they can help um, with your dignity of actually um, feeling and finding your way through things. Lots of little things that people actually wouldn't even give a second thought to um, are actually quite practical. People, if, you, if you've got your knife and fork the wrong way around, um, be gentle and and kind of um, sort of say, oh, just hang on a sec. Can you pop that down and turn it round and and help help in those ways? Um, don't make big issues of them because always remember the person knows what those issues are themselves. So help them by not making a big deal of it. And there's nothing wrong either. Uh, I'm not ashamed of my PCA diagnosis um, you know I've got what I've got and that's that's all there is to it and if if it means somebody needing to go and have a quiet word in somebody's ear just you know if you put something down or can you change things I actually don't mind that because I'd still rather I'd rather still be able to go out and about than find that I'm limited by other people's embarrassment um, and by my realising what's happening. And it's about this, you know, please help me, um, but don't make a big deal of it. Yes, I, I would totally agree with that, Martina. Um, interestingly, uh, when we used to go out, I used to try and make sure uh, we had a table where there was enough space for Peter mm -hmm. to be able to move around and to get into the chair, which sometimes was a bit tricky. Um, so we always used to, I always used to say that before I book somewhere, um, and obviously, once um, there was a diagnosis and uh, Peter had received a severe sight impairment, um, that actually helped in some ways because people then had a bit more of a label and understanding. Um, so actually, that was helpful. Um, finding, um, finding your way through the cutlery and plates um, on a shiny table didn't bother Peter. And I know a lot of people with PCA find that very difficult. Although having said that, um, I don't think people should be afraid to eat things with their fingers and you know that's not a problem um, uh, I think on one occasion I was a bit a bit alarmed when um, he tried to tackle muscles with a knife and fork and I was thinking oh no I'm not quite sure I've done this risk assessment um, so we did just try and talk about that and say I said would you like me to can I help you you know get the muscles out and I can do it myself so then we tried to find another way of doing it um, so I think as you say it's just the constant problem solving finding a way and I think um, the message that comes through very, very strongly from the very beginning of the time we've been um, involved with uh, rare dementia support in the centre is that you're living with this condition and there are ways that you need to try and change, adapt, but it shouldn't stop you doing some of the things that you enjoy. But you might need to take a bit more time and perhaps allow um, a few more things to happen. If food goes on the floor or something, well, that's one of those things. <laughs> Thank you, Bay. Thank you. Um, the next question, I wondered maybe if Kier and Livy, you might um, be able to share some thoughts on this one. So it's about um, getting certified and Val, you le led us nicely into this, um, a certificate of visual impairment. And how much does that, so there are a couple of questions about this. I'm going to try and seamlessly merge them into one. Um, how much does that allow for perceptual problems as well as just sight mm. difficulties? Um, is anyone working on redefining those terms? And 
do we have any advice for anyone who is going to see an ophthalmologist um, to get certified? Uh, yes. So any thoughts on that? So I can start quickly. Um, so while we have seen, again, um, from uh, feedback from support group members and research participants, some improvement in people who are getting registered as being um, sight impaired um, or severely sight impaired over the last few years, clearly there's still a way to go where you know it is common for people to see an eye health professional and then for them to be told well your eyes are fine so i'm not really sure why we're having this conversation but emphasizing i'm not an ophthalmologist or an optometrist my understanding is on the certificate for visual impairment there is a category where it's sight loss owing to a cortical basis so for example somebody's had a stroke and then they've had visual loss because of their stroke um, i think it's probably sensible to include maybe in the minutes from this meeting that there's an article from a neuro ophthalmologist who's infinitely more qualified than I am to talk about this it's based on his recommendation that PCA should be grounds as being sufficient for being severely sight impaired even for people who have um, spared visual acuity so for example people might be familiar with that acuity chart we have lots of letters and unfortunately people with PCA sometimes can get lost in the chart but actually if you're presenting them those letters one by one their acuity can be quite good but just because their acuity is good, it shouldn't say that they don't have a sight impairment, for example. Um, and also, I think another thing that could be included on minutes is some training we put out with the College of Optometrists. Um, this was something that um, a, a few people actually involved in the support groups have contributed to, something called Which Test is Best, where three people with PCA were independently assessed by an ophthalmologist, an optometrist, and a neurologist to get an idea about how to reliably assess visual functions for people who've got diminished vision owing to PCA. Thanks, Kim. Uh, and also quickly, um, Tim Shakespeare put out an article specifically for optometrists. I also put out an article for Acuity Magazine, which is the optometrist professional uh, magazine. And perhaps these articles could also be shared if someone is due to have an appointment with an eye health professional. Thank you, Kia. Libby. Uh yeah, lovely. So just to, to lead on from that, um, I think it's important to note that um, we do have a lot of health professionals who come through um, our rare dementia support subscription mailing list. And there has been quite a lot of ophthalmologists who have been in contact with us directly to get some more understanding of what PCA is. Um, maybe just to add something about um, being registered as sight impaired and with benefits and just to emphasize that you are the expert and sometimes in these situations you might find that he who shouts the loudest gets heard and just to let you know that everyone at um, Rare Dementia Support and within the direct support team we're really happy to support you with that and we emphasize and um, really listing out what the issues are and sometimes this can help influence people and for them to take you more seriously. Um, many times people get denied things um, and it's often that a second time appeal has a much higher success rate. So when applying for things, maybe expect to be turned down the first time and then go back and appeal and you'll find that it's more highly successful. And yes, as I'll say again, we're more than happy to support you with that process. Thank you, Libby. Um, and I think, um, yes, if we can maybe think about how we could put together those articles and things that might be helpful um, in a pack that we often think about educating professionals, obviously, and that's a real focus of the service going forward. But we know that often our members are in a really good position to do some of that educating. If you're already in touch with those professionals, it will be really helpful if we can provide you with some materials that you can take along um, with you to those sorts of appointments. And we've done um, similar resources for kind of hospital admissions, those sorts of things. Um, so, yeah, that, those are definitely in our in our plan. Yeah. On that note, can I emphasize the value of people living with PCA contributing their experience directly? Because I, I just like to pick up on a point Martina made about, um, for example, with words, sometimes they're inside out or upside down. I think historically an issue with, say, someone like a, who's got a neuropsychology background like myself is you fall on jargonistic kind of discipline specific words. So I might refer to a peripheral acquired dyslexia, but if I'm saying that to an occupational therapist, like you know, it doesn't necessarily carry so much meaning. 
So I just like to emphasize how valuable it can be for people. I know Val also has, has done a lot of professional engagement, people actually speaking directly to a range of professionals. And I'd like to think that we're improving, you know, at UCL and how we communicate between different professional audiences. Thanks. I was, yeah. I was, going, I was just going to say, if you're struggling, don't be shy to ask for a second opinion because you know, not, not all doctors, ophthalmologists get it right. And, you know, most people are pretty relaxed about people going and seeking a, a second second opinion. So you should do that if you're not getting the, the support you or the diagnosis that you feel that you, you've got. Sorry, could I ask a question, please? Um, so what's the definitive, what, what is the, the measuring stick of um, actually granting somebody a certificate of visual impairment? Is it because they physically can't see the letters or it's diminishing or is there is it does it depend where you go um as to whether somebody will actually have an open mind and say well hang on a minute let's ask a few more questions or is that a, can it be as long as a piece of string i don't know the the criteria for um you know, declaring somebody visually impaired but what i can say is that if you do visual acuity test and you do all the sort of standard ophthalmological assessment and somebody with PCA, they can sail through it with completely normal mm -hmm. results. And it's only when you start listening to the history, the story, um, that actually some of these things like Val's description um, of the of the, the wren and the heron and um, the, 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 the appearance of somebody standing on the table, that's what gives, that's what gives it away. I think, um, but if I just may say, if we've got time, um, we did find um, it took a long time to actually get um, a referral to be able to go and get um, uh, a certificate. In the end, we did um, go to, uh, I think it was a neuro ophthalmologist, I think I'm right in saying that. Um, but we had to wait a year and a half. And the first um, assessment that we had before then, uh, Peter didn't pass because he could walk uh, the distance that you had to walk. So even though, he might look at the, um, the green man and think that's fine to walk across the road, or he might look at the green traffic light and think, oh, that's fine to go across the road. That didn't come into it. So I think some of the criteria may be changing a little um, at this time. I believe that they're looking at revising some of the guidelines. Um, so I think, again, just be persistent and try and make sure you get um, you know, the best opportunities that you can with, with your regional support that you have in the area that you are, and do contact um, RDS because you know they're very good at signposting where you might be able to go to and as Keir said you know collecting all this information together is going to be invaluable when you you already have quite an exhaustive time trying to find your way through any of the systems um, and if you're lucky and you can can coordinate some of them you're doing a really good job Thank you, Val, and and everyone for um, all your thoughts on that and I think yeah we've we've previously um, recommended neuro ophthalmologists where we've known that they've had experience with PCA beforehand and I think going forward it, it would be really nice if we can um, using the information we have for the, from those different professionals that are registered with us if we can start to sort of map out um, a network of, of people we know who know of PCA and and I'm sure that will be a part of our kind of educational and professional um, education plan going forward. Um, thank you, all of our panelists, so much for your for your contributions. Um, we're we're just out of time now, but we we do have questions that we haven't managed to answer um, today. So we'll we'll discuss and hopefully we'll be able to record a kind of follow up um, session like this to to get through the rest of those questions um, and to send that on to you. And, and we'll send you the link to the recording of this whole session um, once that's ready. But I just wanted to yeah say thank you ever so much to to our panelists for all of your contributions. It's it's been so helpful. Helpful, and I'm sure everyone at home has found it um, really informative and inspiring as well. Um, I also wanted to shout out to those behind the scenes who are doing lots, but we can't see them. Um, so thanks to Millie and Emily and Roberta and Nikki and Claire for all the work they've done um, to, to make today happen as well. Um, 
that we're aware obviously that it is a very um, challenging, difficult time at the moment and things are changing. So maybe some of you are, are getting out and about a bit more. Um, maybe some of you aren't able to yet. And I know that's coming with all of its own um, kind of stresses. And um, we have um, put together a survey to try and better capture um, the experiences of people with rare dementias in particular during lockdown. Um, and I know lots of you have already completed that. So thank you um, ever so much for your contributions to that. Um, and just to not forget that we, we're here, as we've mentioned, throughout between meetings as well. Um, so do get in touch with the direct support team. Um, if you have any follow on questions from for any of our panelists, do just get in touch. Um, we're definitely here between meetings and would always love to hear from you, um, whether it's just for a general check in or a catch up or you have specific queries. Um, do let us know. I, I'm not sure if Seb is. Um, going to pop in and and say anything to wrap up or if he's happy um for us to just oh it looks like it there we go <laughs> thanks no um, need really for me to say anything than to other than to say a particular thanks to you emma for coordinating all of today bringing the agenda together and these fabulous speakers um i've been busily in the background listening in and scribbling down a number of the uh, uh particularly that val and martina but also some of the questioners have been sharing and as with all of these meetings, it provides us real, with real food for thought, both for trying to understand and support these uh, symptoms and uh, experiences that you're having better. Um, and also to dig into the science, there are several things that have been said that we're, I think we genuinely don't know always why these things are occurring, why you're grappling with some of the, the problems that you are. Um, and it's truly inspiring. Um, and I hope for you, um, encouraging that we will be working away between meetings uh, to try and not just get a better answer, but actually deepen our understanding about the nature of this condition. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Uh, so we'll all um, wave goodbye now, but we're going to leave you with a brief video about the fundraising um, for Rare Dementia Support from the National Brain Appeal. Um, but yes, thank you all. It's been great to see you and bye from all of us. Hello, my name is Eva Tate and I'm the Major Appeals Manager and Manager of the Rare Dementia Support Fund held by the charity, the National Brain Appeal. The National Brain Appeal raises money as the dedicated charity for the National Hospital for Neurology and Neurosurgery and UCL Queen's Square Institute of Neurology. The National Brain Appeal raises funds for Rare Dementia Support's 2,000 members to help individuals living with rare and early onset forms of dementia, their families, friends and healthcare professionals. And we also hold several other funds for FTD and dementia research. The funding helps not only the support group meetings in London, but also the regional support groups, admin and support staff and all other associated expenses, including the new online support groups. When, when things return to normal, there are travel and accommodation bursaries available to help members attend the meetings. This year, we've raised our fundraising target to 300,000, and this will rise further to 350,000 by 2022 to develop and extend the service in the areas of education, support and research, with the ultimate aim that everyone affected by a form of rare dementia will have access to specialist information and support, as well as contact with other people with a similar condition. We apply for grants from grant making trusts, foundations and livery companies and have a wonderful group of supporters, some of whom are here today, who fundraise for us in an amazing variety of ways. We would love it if you would like to sign up to our RDS fundraising newsletter to hear more of these stories and receive news of how we can support this community. We have had people do head shaves for us. We have had um, a gentleman drive across the Mongolian steppe in a VW polo and we have lots of people who take part in runs and virtual runs as well. At the end of February, we held a gala dinner called Mission Possible, where we raised 110,000 for the expansion of Red Dementia support. And we are delighted to announce that in line with this expansion, the charity is committed to raise up to 7 million to create the world's first centre of excellence for Rare Dementias. If anyone would like to discuss any fundraising ideas or the new Capital Appeal, um, please do feel free to email me or my colleague Alexis, our senior fundraising manager, who will speak about the innovative new ways you can be involved in fundraising for RDS, even during this challenging time. Thank you very much. Hello, my name is Alexis Gebby and I'm the senior fundraising officer at the National Brain Appeal. 
Um, I just want to start off by saying a huge thank you to all of you who already fundraise for RDS. We really appreciate all of your incredible efforts, especially at this difficult time. My role at the National Brain Appeal is to look after all the amazing people taking on various fundraising activities for us. We have had people challenging themselves to run marathons, cycle long distances, climb mountains and even take on skydives, all whilst raising money for RDS. We also have wonderful fundraisers out in the community who organise golf days, hold coffee mornings, host choir and carol concerts and even shave their heads. These people ensure that more people like you can be supported through Rare Dementia support. If you're interested in becoming one of our fundraising heroes, then please do contact me. I am here to support you with your fundraising and I'm more than happy to chat about any ideas that you may have. While at the moment it isn't possible to take part in a sporting challenge or hold a big fundraising gathering in your local community, we do have some fundraising ideas, such as taking on a solo virtual run or walk, posting a quiz for your friends or family online, asking for birthday donations in lieu of going out or even donating money that you may be saving by not travelling to work or buying your daily coffee. Do get in touch with me if you would like to get involved. In the meantime, take care and we hope to see you soon.